Welcome everybody to um, this session of Data Science in the News. This uh, webinar series is brought to us by the Centre for Data Science and the Queensland Academy of the Arts and Sciences. I'd like to start by acknowledging the, um, the Turrbal and Yuggera people uh, as the First Nations custodians of the lands on which QUT now stands, and also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country from which you're all joining us today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. Today we are going to touch on the topic of the Australian economy. So you can pick up any newspaper, digital or, or paper copy, you can look through any sort of listen to any uh, news uh, discussion, and there will be some aspects of the economy that are being discussed at the moment. So it's a great topic for our data science in the news webinar series. So today, for example, just in, in some of the, the headlines are about you know, interest rates, the jobs summit, the housing crisis, property prices, rental prices, tent villages, pay and pay gaps, inflation. So what we want to explore in this uh, webinar is the uh, ask our panel members to talk about some of the economic issues that impact all of us. These issues include the inflation, housing, jobs, interest rates, and more through the lens of data science. What does data and data science have to do with these topics that touch us all? We've convened a fantastic panel to talk through these topics in the next hour. So we have with us Catherine Smythe, the Acting Director um, who, of the Consumer Price Index at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Who better to talk through some of these topics with us? We also have three people from QUT, Professor Adam Clements from the School of Economics and Finance, Professor, Associate Professor Connie Sicilowati uh, from the same school, and Dr. Catherine Ilango from the school as well. So let me give a little bit of a bio to these people and perhaps they can wave when I'm talking about them and then we'll go to each of them and ask for their perspectives on this topic. So let me talk through the, the introduce you more, um, more detail to the four speakers. So we've got the panel members. The first panel member is Catherine Smythe. Catherine's a leader in the consumer price index section at the ABS. She's got experience across both producer and consumer prices, and she's guided analysts in transitioning to new data collection, compilation and analytic approaches. She um, holds a Bachelor of Statistics from the ANU, and she has prior experience in market research. The second speaker is um, Professor Adam Clements. So Adam has been at um, QUT for a long time, and prior to this, uh, he was employed in the funds management industry. And his, um, his research has been published in journals such as the Journal of American Statistical Association, Journal of Banking and Finance, Journal of Forecasting. And so he's this fantastic background in econometrics um, and time series, and um, especially around forecasting volatility and um, derivative and spot market link linkages. So our third panel member is Associate Professor Connie Sicilowati. So Connie is an associate professor in um, the school, and she is interested in the areas of property economics, civil engineering, construction management, and operation research. So she's interested in sustainable property and infrastructure, multi-stakeholder partnerships, and international issues result related to real estate, property, and infrastructure de delivery management. And our fourth panel member is Dr. Catherine Alanko. And uh, Dr. Alanko is the senior lecturer in the School of Economics and Finance here at QUT, and her research is in the area of banking and finance and investment. And she's interested in director trading, prediction markets, regime switching, and, um, and um, financial intelligence. She actually worked in the area of financial intelligence for the Attorney General's Department, the Australian Customs Service, and Austrac. So she's been employed as a forecaster for the economic consultancy Econtech. And before that, she was working in asset consulting with Towers Perrin. 
So she's got a lot of experience to bring to this panel, as have all of our panel members, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they're going to talk to us about. So ask, I'm going to ask each of them now to talk for roughly five minutes on a perspective of the topic, and I'm going to start first with, um, with um, Catherine Smythe. And Catherine has, um, is going to tell us a little bit about advances in the Australian CPI. So over to you, Catherine. Great, thank you very much um, for that introduction, Kerry. I'll just bring up my slides. All right, um, so today I will be talking to you about how the data sources in the CPI have evolved over the years and how that has led to um, the quite exciting development of us soon being able to produce a monthly indicator of inflation. Um, so first up, just looking at uh, this particular slide, so data for the CPI is collected by several different methods. Around about half of the CPI is still collected manually, so from websites or over the phone. Um, around about a third of it is collected from administrative data sources, which we get from both businesses as well as government. Uh, but it's the other two data sources that you can see on this slide here where things have really changed in the last five to six years. So you can see in yellow there, um, web scraped data. So we've got web scrapers or basically automated bots that are collecting pricing data from online retailers, which are run once to twice per week. And this data feeds into collections such as clothing, alcohol and car accessories. Um, but my personal favourite on the slide here is the remaining uh, quadrant of that, that circle, so scanner data that you can see in grey there, which accounts for about 16% of the CPI. Um, and it's, it's just such a powerful tool. So the ABS, uh, we receive scanner data from the four major supermarket chains in Australia, and we receive this data on a weekly basis. Um, for each week, the data set shows us how many of every single product um, sold by the supermarket, so recorded by stockkeeping unit, how many was sold, and the, also the total expenditure on each product. And so we can use all this information to derive average prices. Um, so back in 2014, we first used this data in the production of the CPI. We just used a very simple direct replacement method. So um, we were using it to replace the data which had previously been collected by our field officers. So really reduced our data collection costs, but obviously it's not a very sophisticated way to be using such a rich data source. Um, so after a few years of development and research, in the December quarter 2017, we introduced what are known as multilateral price index methods to the CPI. Um, and so these are used for basically all our grocery items. So food, tobacco, and other household products such as our cleaning products, um, the more infamous example of toilet paper as well. So you may be wondering how do multilateral methods differ to traditional price index methods? Um, traditional index methods, they rely on a very carefully selected sample of data and they typically have fixed weights as well. Um, so, <laughs> What we're able to do with multilateral methods is actually use the entire census of scanner data that we're receiving. We're able to account for every sing single transaction that's going through these major supermarket chains. Um, but another really incredible feature that we have through these multilateral methods is the ability to update the weights in each and every period. Um, so expenditure weighting, it's a real game changer. So previously, the traditional methods that we used for price index compilation, they were not really able to account for substitution by consumers. And this has resulted previously in some quite notable spikes in the Australian CPI. So um, a few people listening today might remember back when Cyclones Larry and Yazi destroyed much of Australia's banana crop. And this really caused banana prices to spike. And this then resulted in massive spikes in the Australian CPI fruit series, which you can see on the left there, and cons consequently the overall CPI. Um, and this is because we were not able to adjust the weights to account for that change in expenditure. Um, but this is exactly the sort of thing that our multilateral methods can account for now. So this has been really handy throughout the pandemic. We've really reaped the benefits of it when there's been a lot of consumer substitution. Um, you know, consumers not necessarily substituting away for more expensive products, but they're just buying whatever was available during those panic buying periods. Um, and even lately when lettuce has been really expensive, you know, fewer people will be buying lettuce and we've been able to take that into account. Um, just quickly, the graph on the right, you can see our published CPI series in blue. 
In red, you can see the same series that's been recreated using scanner data and multilateral index methods. You can just see how much less volatile this approach is. Um, and that's because out of season products, which are typically more expensive, they're not carrying such a high weight within the index. So it's because of these developments and this higher frequency of data that we're now getting um, that we will very soon be able to produce a monthly indicator of inflation. So we've actually scheduled the first release of a monthly CPI indicator for October 26th. Um, and that's the same day as a quarterly CPI release. So it's nice and easy for everyone to remember. Um, in that release, we will be including data for the months of July, August and September. And then following that release, the monthly data will be published on a monthly basis. So providing stakeholders with a really timely indicator of inflation. Um, I will note, just it's quite important to note that we're calling this an indicator of inflation as not every single product in the CPI sample is being updated each month. So you can see on the slide here, um, about 43% of the basket is updated monthly and the rest of the data, uh, it will either be updated that month or carried forward um, from the previous period. And just very quickly, so here's a little sneak peek at, at how the series is tracking. Um, so you can see the monthly series that we've backcast in blue and how that aligns to the current uh, quarterly CPI series in red. And you can see it's a very close correlation. So we believe that this is going to be quite um, valuable for stakeholders such as the Reserve Bank in helping them make more timely monetary policy decisions. Um, but thanks very much, Kerry, and I look forward to hearing everyone's questions. Oh, thanks very much. That was inter very interesting, Catherine. Wow, that's a pretty steep um, curve on that graph. Uh, increase <laughs> it is. On that graph. Um, so yeah, so we'll be keen to know, to know a little bit more about like what what the implications of that are for people as well. Um, so let's hold that in escrow then that that question and um, and we'll turn now to Adam. So Adam Clements, um, Adam's going to talk to us about um, the recent changes in economic conditions and uh, the information about the state of the economy and how that's crucial for informing policy responses and how we need sort of real-time measures of economic activity. So over to you, Adam. So, yeah, thanks, Kerry. Um, I, I wanted to um, actually follow on with a, a little bit of a, a similar theme to, to some of the things that Catherine's uh, spoken about um, in terms of monitoring things in, in real time. Um, Right. So obviously, you know, everyone will be aware that you know, inflation has been rising in, in most developed economies around the world. Um, and this is obviously, you know, has, has negative consequences on people's purchasing power and and so forth. Now, not all, but the, the majority of central banks have some type of inflation target or band as, as one of their main policy focus. Um, and so clearly this rising inflation, 7 9%, 10% in, in, in many developed economies is, is certainly uh, on the radar of the, the, um, the relevant local central bank. So it's, it's, it's monetary policy, as you know, we've, we've probably been reading in the news recently, it's monetary policy and, and interest rates that, that are the main tool that, that central banks use to combat inflation. And so the, the idea here is, is that... Um, um, interest rate increases are used to dampen demands, uh, demand for goods and services to reduce inflationary pressures. Now, um, as I said, as we would be um, no, you know, as, as we would be aware, oh, sorry, um, interest rates have been rising quite rapidly. So here I've got a snapshot from Bloomberg that I actually was talking about in, in one of my units uh, courses just the other day. So we can see that, so this is the government, Australian government, Commonwealth government securities yield curve moving out towards 30 years in this direction from one year ago. So um, I know it's slightly small to see on, on half a PowerPoint slide, but interest rates over the, uh, at that time out to maybe a year or two were very, very close to zero. And this, Green curve was the, the Commonwealth Government securities yields for from about three or four weeks ago, so quite a recent one. So we've seen a rapid increase in, in interest rates of around about 2% or thereabouts um, within well, well within the last 12 months. And so that interest rates are clearly on the way up um, from historical lows. Um, and there is 
obviously plenty of scope for central banks to raise interest rates. Um, they've been sitting at historical lows for a long time um, post global financial crisis or, or post most of that time. Um, and I guess one of the, the big questions that the central banks, including the Reserve Bank here in Australia, is grappling with is, is how much and or and or how fast to raise interest rates to combat this inflationary um, inflationary problem. And so central banks really only want to raise interest rates enough to bring down inflationary pressures, but don't want to tip the economy onto the other side in terms of towards uh, a recession. Um, so that you know, it's a, it's a bit of a balancing act in terms of dampening activity to some degree to, to reduce inflationary pressures, but without tipping the economy over too far. And so, you know, given the rapid changes in, in rising prices and so forth, it, you know, it's it's really imperative to to know how the economy and and consumers and investors and the like are, are responding in in real time. And so, it's 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 you know, information at a higher frequency, I guess, than, than a lot of uh, traditional economic data series could be quite useful in this context. And to, to I suppose, give, in some sense, kind of real-time measures and and um, uh, or measurements of, of what's happening on the ground right now. And, you know, how are consumers making decisions about their spending, you know, on a weekend? Are they spending less? Are they spending more um, as, as days progress? So one thing that I was, I, was, I was reading about quite recently that I thought would be really interesting in, in this context of, of trying to get a really real-time picture of what's happening in the economy on a day-to-day -day basis um, is, is some technology that's been developed to track the real-time, I guess, recovery um, of, of COVID and impacts of COVID on on macroeconomic conditions. So there's been a really interesting US-based example um, of this harnessing, I guess, in quotes, what we could call big data sources. And I, I want, let me just quickly jump across and just show you a, a picture of what the, um, so here's just a quick plot of what the um, level of consumer spending across the aggregate of the US looked like. So here we've got the period when we're going into COVID and the steady recovery out of COVID. And there's a whole range of different other indicators that they generate. Um, but I just wanted to spend the next couple, last couple of minutes, I guess I should say, talking about the the ideas and the sort of data sources behind um, behind this more sort of real time measurement. So, so a lot of this <clears throat> draws on uh, aggregated credit credit card activity, credit card spending, small business transactions, and revenues um, from aggregators of uh, sales and so forth to track things like um, loyalty programs and credit card loyalty programs and things like this. So um, the technology draws on data that's already been aggregated up to a, uh, up to a certain level, as opposed to trying to you know, record individual transactions from, from individual people or households. And they also track a, a whole range of other um, you know, job postings online and, and things like that. Um, now, this technology has been developed to provide a daily index of, of economic activity. Um, now, you know, it's quite, it's quite clear that, that the RBA and, and, and obviously the, the ABS do monitor more frequent data than, than simply monthly or quarterly macroeconomic um, releases. But what's really interesting about some of this um, technology is that th this kind of data and, and this, these types of approaches certainly can provide more granular in a time series sense, but even geographically uh, focused, um, if we want, in terms of real-time measures of uh, economic activity. And so, you know, we I'm, I'm sure we could all sit down and, and, and brainstorm a whole range of other potentially interesting sources of data, anything from sort of postal courier service activity, given the, the, the rise of online shopping, Google search for particular products or mobility or traffic data around shopping precincts on a weekend and things like this. So there's certainly a, a, a you know, a, a wide scope, I think, in, in the next sort of few years going forward to to develop these sorts of tools to to provide real time more real-time measures of, of economic activity so all right that's, pro that's probably my time up so I'll stop sharing uh, thanks very much Adam it's really interesting to hear about some of those alternative uh, measures and how it might help us to uh, to be able to obtain this information in a more timely manner and I guess the the 
the some interesting questions out of that may be around you know like, like what how will that actually change people's behavior uh, in the in the shorter term as well having that kind of access to information but again we'll leave that to towards the end yep. and i'll ask our third panel member to um to um talk to us and that's connie Sisilawati. so um connie's going to talk to us about um housing challenges in the current Australian economy and how interest rates impact housing affordability. And she'll also explain how you know, COVID-19 and inflation and interest rates impact on housing supply and demand. So I know there's a lot of people who would be very interested in this topic. So over to you then, Connie. Uh, Connie, we can't hear you. Yes, sorry. Oh, um... Now we can. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Carrie. And uh, it's very difficult to continue with Adam, which has a very complicated um, technology and data, as, as well as Catherine. But I try uh, to actually unpack a very complex problems, which is the housing challenges with the current Australian economy. So, um, so I just want to extend my acknowledgement to Turrbal and Yagara people uh, in this land. The outline of my sort of discussion, I will start with briefly about what is the condition of Australian economics currently, uh, how that, in, uh, what is the housing affordability and the housing challenges we face. And hopefully we got time to discuss just briefly about the housing policy. So um, as we know that uh, economy, uh, Australian economy is not just uh, impacted with the domestic, but is also with the global situation. And I'm not going to discuss uh, a lot about this, but everyone knows how that uh, war in Ukraine and the global pandemics impacted Australian economy. But I want to move on to the second item here that every time when we go to the see doctor, when we say, okay, I'm, uh, what is the health indicator of a person? Maybe the blood pressure, our temperature and so forth. But for her, our economy is actually three main indicators. The first one is the GDP and then continue with the inflation rate and unemployment rates. At the moment, our GDP, even though it's not, great, but it's not really the main problem. The same thing, unemployment rates are currently quite low. So the problem out of those three indicators is actually inflation, high inflation rates. So I will unpack that just briefly. And um, as inflation rates, uh, I think Adam talking about interest rates as well. So a uh, brief discussion on that. So we know the inflation rate um, currently quite high, 6.1%. And this, this is like, um, I think the government actually saying we expecting to be uh, not getting better soon, but it will be maybe worse than before getting better. So we, we, we will see this probably raising even higher uh, before it's getting lower. The one of the um, like uh, initiative from Reserve Bank is actually try to change through in interest rate, and we can see that even though in this graph it doesn't really show the he like the increase of uh, the interest rate because of the scaling is not really uh, looking at uh, quite high. But uh, the trend that some of the people probably when they pick up the mortgage, they actually in the low interest rate, but now we know that uh, interest rate is actually uh, going higher. And from this graph is actually the combination of the uh, fixed rate and standard variable rate. As you can see, the fixed rate is actually trending even faster. I think that is a good indicator that people expecting or the bank, the lenders expecting that uh, interest rate will climb and hopefully after get certain inflation rate back to the two to three percent 
and then our interest rate will go down. So again, we're expecting a hike in the interest rate in the near future. Uh, I don't have the crystal ball, but that's kind of like the indication from the data. So I will move on to um, the topic that is really close to my heart, which is housing affordability. Housing affordability measurement that is quite uh, accepted in Australia and around the world is uh, just a simple uh, calculation of what is the housing cost compared to the overall household income. So the rule of thumb, if they are less than 30%, they are not in the housing stress. But if they are more than 30%, can be 45, 55 or more, um, they are in the housing stress, especially uh, people in the bottom 40% of the income, which is uh, quantile one and two. Unfortunately, our uh, 2021 um, data wasn't like not fully available, so I cannot continue analyze or like doing the comparison for this housing stress data that I comparing three census before 21. But I just want to show this that uh, the first two quantile, which is the bottom 40% of the quantile, um, people are, are spending more than 30% of their uh, income. And it doesn't matter whether you own mortgage or, you know, paying mortgage or paying rent. And uh, really uh, surprised me when I analyzed this, even if you're renting in the uh, social housing or community housing, if you are in the bottom, the very bottom, you still uh, experience housing stress. So this is quite alarming in terms of how that, this is an old data and I'm expecting in 2021, uh, will be similar, like the um, the pressure is there, it's still the same, but uh, some probably suggest it may be worse. So the housing challenges is not just about the uh, level of income, but it's also uh, driven by the, the current uh, high uh, costs of housing. So it's very complex. Housing is not just about... Um, uh, a lot of problem is driven by supply side, but it's also uh, there are some demand issues in here. So we have the main demand for housing, obviously the local, but we also have uh, overseas um, and interstate migration. And uh, with the supply side, we got uh, the new and existing housing. So what's happened then with COVID-19, we can see contracted of uh, not too many offices uh, because the close of the border and the new housing also contracted. And with the high inflation rate, um, making um, like it's become more expensive to actually build a new home. We got a little bit more pressure when the overseas uh, migration uh, will come again, which is probably push, uh, increase the demand on the houses. So uh, those challenges, um, if we compare with the uh, hike of the interest rate, it's really complex. We, we don't have, uh, we can't really just looking at uh, the impact of interest rate in the housing just for one uh, particular groups. We got owner occupiers, including first home buyers, and then uh, investors and also renters. And just uh, 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 like with the recent um, unexpected impact in the COVID-19, that the housing price is actually in increase people will think oh the housing market will crash during COVID-19 is actually the opposite it's a seller market and the price was increased so some of the investors decided that they want to actually sell and uh, their investment property to to get the capital gains and that will actually bring a lot more pressure because we have less rental 
accommodation, so a lot of pressure in the renters. I can discuss about this connection quite a, quite a, in probably in the question and answer if anyone wants to ask question, but I will move on because of the timing. The recent figure of the new loan commitments that released by ABS yesterday, we know that uh, the, in, the new uh, in loan commitment by uh, investor has dropped the highest. So we have less new investors committed in a loan uh, for owner occupiers only dropped by 7%, but overall it's dropped. But also our building approval, it was dropped. Now it's a little bit stabilized, but we talk about building approval doesn't mean that the building will be uh, built uh, quite um uh, in a very short period of time because of the uh, shortage on the labor trades and the, uh, a lot of issues in the construction industry, which is topic for another day. So uh, to conclude, I want to just touch briefly about the housing policy. I just want to say that to help to solve housing issues, we can't just rely on one only uh, solution. For example, to intensify the investor, we uh, the government provide the negative gearings, but negative gearing alone will not solve uh, the lack of supply or the investor will invest in the housing um, if they don't have any other um, in instrument to help. And also we have uh, other stakeholders that require different um, assistance. And we have that low income quantile, they need help in different way from the majority of the uh, population. And, and we need help on the supply side because lack of supply will drive the price higher and that will make housing affordability even worse. Thank you. Thanks very much, Connie. That was um, that was very informative. If people have questions, please put them in the Q and A, and um, and we'll be able to either answer them as we go along, or else come to them at the end. Right. We come now to our fourth panel member, and that's Catherine Ulanko. And um, Catherine's going to talk to us about economic forecasting. So over to you, Catherine. All right. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, so I just thought I'd have a, a quick chat about the idea of forecasting, because obviously, if we can forecast what we think is going to happen in terms of eco economic conditions in the future, then that helps us to prepare for the conditions that we might be about to face. Forecasting typically has a pretty bad name um, in that we often don't get it right. But I really wanted to stress that there is still a really important use for it. And so, you know, if we have a look at the history of forecasting, what it really comes back to is looking at what's going on around us, understanding what's going on around us, and then using that information to try and help us prepare for the future. Um, it is really important that we have good information. And so whether it's us looking at the world around us or in this particular circumstance where we're looking at the economy, it's really crucial to have the, that data, the information that's um, available, and the ABS is a great source of, um, of data for us. And then it comes down to, okay, well, how are we actually going to apply this, this data that we've got? So um, I have a, a chart here that's a lot like Connie's, where we were looking at what the inflation rates look like over time, only if we're thinking about forecasting and thinking, okay, well, maybe in order to get a good forecast, we need lots of information. You know, we need as much data as we can get. But if I have a look at inflation rates all the way back to 1923, actually I'm losing some information because the, um, the way the economy was being run at the time is quite different. And so you can see quite big uh, peaks and troughs here. Uh, you know, we had inflation, um, of course, during the depression that was you know minus 10 to 12 percent and then um, at other times in the 1950s where it was up around 23 24 percent that's not likely to happen at the moment um, so yes we can use all of that data we can do something really simple like just having a line of best fit here and saying okay well if we know what the average essentially 
uh, inflation rate is, then we'll assume that inflation will come back to that average. So even though we know the inflation rate is quite high at the moment, we'll assume that it will come back to that average. Um, and we can, we can use better instruments than that. So we can use um, different forecasting techniques. Uh, so we can say, okay, well, maybe that data set is too big. Maybe that the data is not all that useful. Maybe we need to focus a bit more on more recent data. Um, and so the, the green box here tells us that, um, or, or looks at the inflation rates during the period where our government has specifically said that they are targeting an inflation rate of two to three percent. So maybe that information is more useful for us. So we, if we just look at that part of the data, again, uh, we can look at setting up some interesting forecasting models here. Um, so obviously inflation here is my, my green line and then the blue and pink lines are just setting up that target, that band that we know uh, the government is hoping to get inflation between. My yellow dotted line here is giving me um, the average over that time. Um, and then again, we could be using that information just to say, well, this is what we are expecting inflation to be. Um, and then I've got my orange dotted line here, which is a more, uh, more updated kind of information. You know, um, Adam and Catherine were both talking about how we can use more updated information to really get a feel for where we're at. And so, you know, this is just a, a simple sort of moving average. And so, yes, we can get a better version of a forecast from that. And so if you look at the most recent numbers on there, inflation at the moment is about 6% and we'd be forecasting it to be coming back to about four, four and a half percent. But we need to be thinking a little bit more about what that actually means, okay? And so we could go even further and say, well, yeah, this, this spike that's happened, if that continues to happen, we're going to have inflation rates that are way too high. So what we then know is that the government will step in and they will uh, exercise their monetary policy tools and say, okay, if we increase interest rates, what we hope will happen is that that will come back down. So in a sense, I have two quite different forecasts here. One might be that it that the inflation rate could continue and the other that it will revert back to some sort of an average. And both are interesting and correct in different ways because they're telling us different things. The first one is telling us um, if the government does nothing, then our inflation will probably continue to increase, um, but we're assuming that they will do something and so it will start to come back down. So um, I think it's really important to be thinking about our forecasts in the context of what are they actually doing for us um, and what information are we trying to get out of them. So what I think is super important next is to be thinking about, okay, well, we have some ideas about what could happen to inflation rates. What does that actually mean? So as I said, um, I think the most important impact that we think about is the relationship between inflation and interest rates. So as I suggested, because inflation is high at the moment, we would expect governments to respond to that through their uh, monetary policy, which basically means they can increase their interest rates and hope that that will decrease inflation. So if we, if we think about what that actually means, it means that if interest rates are rising, people are not going to borrow as much money to spend in the economy, okay? Because it's more expensive and their repayments will have to be higher. So we, we have a pretty natural relationship that says, okay, if, if inflation is increasing, we're expecting the government to increase interest rates to bring that inflation back down. Um, and then as Connie was saying, if we look at things like housing, which are, are super important, again, if interest rates are rising, it means people will borrow less money. And if they're borrowing less money, then there's less pressure on house prices. So again, just uh, bringing those prices down again in the future. If we think about share markets, um, it gets a little bit trickier, but typically what we say is that share markets are likely to fall as interest rates rise. So again, we're not even 
coming back to the inflation itself. It's the fact that inflation is going to trigger the government to increase the interest rates. And what does that mean for our share markets? So if, uh, if we have interest rates increasing, um, we have inflation pushing up prices, then again, people are spending more money on those day-to-day -day costs of living and they don't have as much to invest. And so what that means is that we would be expecting our share markets to come down at the same time. So obviously all of those things happening at the same time has a big impact on our economy quite generally. So just to sort of wrap things up, I found a few kind of interesting quotes. The first one here talks about um, how in order to get some sort of a reliable forecast, we really need to understand where we're at at the moment. And for me, that's that's really coming down to the data that we can get, the reliability of that data. Um, and, you know, as Adam and Catherine was saying, perhaps it's the timing of the data as well that's really interesting. Um, and I have another one here, all models are wrong, but some are useful, because I think that one uh, really says to us, it's good to have the data, it's good to be using those statistical models, but we really need to understand what are they actually telling us? Um, and thinking through those relationships rather, rather than just relying on our models as a forecast. And then and my final point here was just the reason we want to know what's going to happen in the future is because we want to be prepared for it. So again, thinking along those lines of, okay, well, if we have high inflation today, what does that mean for interest rates? And then on from there, what does that mean in terms of our housing market or our share market? And then we can be prepared when those things occur in the future. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was um, that was really interesting. Thanks, um, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you, Catherine, then just a question um, on the basis of that. You talked about the reliability of the data. And, and, and of course, all of these forecasts have some uncertainty about them, yes? yes. And so how do, how do you see that sort of uncertainty band or the, the uncertainty playing out in the forecasts, and especially when it's fairly volatile um, or you know, going like changing as it is now? And how do you see people responding to that, um, that knowledge that there is uncertainty in these forecasts or do okay. they? Yeah, so, so it's interesting because I think the uncertainty comes around, well, we, we're quite confident about the information that we have, um, and we can see how well it's been collected and where it's been collected and why, but um, the uncertainty comes in what could happen in the future. And so in a sense, then what we're doing is trying to assign some sort of likelihood. So yes, I have a, a a forecast that says inflation, if the government does nothing, will continue to rise. Um, what's the likelihood of that happening? It's not terribly likely because we know that the government will intervene. Um, and so then we can start to look at um, some of the other more likely scenarios that will occur. But we do also know that for the general public, if they are thinking about, oh, actually, this might be a possibility that we're going to continue to have really high inflation, or it might be mean that the government overreacts and tips us the other way. That's where the uncertainty really comes in and that starts to frighten people. And of course, we see that as people get really concerned about that uncertainty and concerned about not knowing what's going to happen in the future, they tend to become more conservative just generally. So conservative in terms of their spending, conservative in terms of their saving. Okay, thank you. That's, um, that's excellent. Um, Catherine Smythe, did, um, the two Catherines here, was lovely bookending this um, panel session with the, the two Catherines. So, so Catherine, I'm, I'm going to follow up with the, the, you know, your graph that had that um, large rise. And so to, would you like to talk a little bit about like, what the implications of that, that um, increase are for, you know, for people who are listening here? Uh, and also when you're talking about these sorts of new data sources, what other sorts of data are being considered to be able to support the kinds of estimates, estimates and, um, and, and work that you do? 
Yeah, certainly. Um, so obviously, uh, we've seen a very interesting period over the last few years with inflation. So pandemic hit and we saw things like the government's free childcare policy, um, which, where we saw the first negative movement in the CPI for a while. And then more recently, um, we've had a lot of factors flowing through to, to higher inflation. And obviously, this is, um, you know, very closely informing the Reserve Bank's monetary policy decisions. So, um, yeah, they're keeping a very close eye on those numbers in terms of what we've got, um, you know, potential new data sources coming into the CPI. Um, so, I mean, we're always on the lookout for further opportunities to get hold of more scanner data. We'd really love to um, broaden the number of areas in which we use that. Um, the ABS is always looking at, at different ways of, you know, I think some areas have access to, um, you know, other, other administrative large data sources, which they use, but it's always a challenge. We have to find ways to use them within our own confidentiality um, limits and things like that. So, so it can be a little bit um, tricky in that space. But I mean, there's there's one thing that I will point out. So in our work with the monthly consumer price index um, indicator, we are looking at developing a monthly series for rents. So I know um, a lot of people are interested in our rent series and, and maybe Connie, this is something that might um, fall into your, your realm of things as well. So a more timely indicator of rents inflation, um, which I think should be interesting for a lot of stakeholders. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm going to just, um, uh, go to Adam then. And Adam, you were talking about different kinds of measures as well. And um, and can we use the kinds of techniques that you're talking about to measure inflation in like real time? And what yeah, would um, be the implications of that? Or how would we use that kind of information? Well, I, I certainly think that I mean, it's clear that the ABS is starting to move in that direction um, already. Um, and I guess there's, there's, you know, hopefully scope for for maybe drawing on agri so so what's at least been nice with some of the technology that i've seen is that they're building on aggregated data sources already so you know possibly there's potential for looking at you know any aggregated sort of websites for you know be it food delivery or whatever where there's a whole bunch of prices brought together in in one arena basically so you know maybe there's some more scope for um more scope for that um I mean, in terms of the usefulness of these things, I, I just think it's it gives policymakers um, a more up-to-date picture of how consumers, investors, whoever they're trying to influence at that particular point in time, a more up-to-date picture of, of how they're responding. Um, and, and I guess that reduces the, the risk a little bit of, uh, I know the context at the moment is that central banks are worried about tipping economies into a recession it's a, it is a risk um with rising rates um you know so I, I guess at least doesn't eliminate the risk of this these these types of events occurring but at, at least it sort of reduces the risk and and gives everyone a more real-time picture of how people are making decisions on a daily basis if or if not maybe weekly basis or or something like that as opposed to maybe two to three months you know after the event yeah thanks adam um that's interesting, and I, I think we all we would all appreciate, um, you know, having more timely information. But then also, I guess there's some sort of risk of having it so timely or, or so real time that we might be sort of responding to every little noise and little bump noise in the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. the signal in that? Yeah, yeah. So I guess there's some sort of like learning about you know how to how to use those kinds of yeah, data. yeah time. Yeah. Catherine, would you like to just, Catherine Smythe, would you like to talk just a little bit to that then? Because is, is there any way that we can find out more details about these kinds of more timely and especially the monthly CPI indicator? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the ABS, we actually released an information paper on the uh, indicator. So on the 16th of August, um, and yeah, so that, that is on our website. If you just go to abs.gov.au um, and then statistics and then research, uh, but it contains a lot of quite important information. So it, it tells um, users about the methods that we're intending to use, uh, some important little things to note. So such as the fact that the monthly will be um, subject to revisions um, under particular circumstances. So all pretty important things to take into account. And there's also a frequently asked questions section. Um, and just on that 
uh, you know, I encourage everyone to take a look at that paper, but we are in a consultation period at the moment. So we welcome any feedback um, if anyone has any thoughts. So uh, I think comments and feedback are closing on the 13th of September. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Catherine Olenka, would you like to add anything to that in terms of economic forecasting? Is there, is there any sort of other comment from you in terms of new data sources or the timeliness of these data? Well, obviously, the more timely the data is, the better our forecasts are because they're being updated um, much more regularly. But again, I think, as, I'm, as Adam said, we do need to be really careful here about not overreacting to every little thing that happens then. Um, and then just being, just being mindful that um, our forecasts typically are long term. So we're, we're trying to think about what's going to happen in the long term rather than adjusting uh, on a day-to-day -day sort of basis. Mm, okay, great. Um, and Connie, to you then, uh, you know, you, you're talking at the end of um, your presentation about sort of housing policy. Uh, and would you like to expand a little bit on that in the context of the discussion that's happening here? Uh, thank you, Gary. So, <clears throat> I mean, like in general, uh, property or housing is unique and it depends on where is the location. I agree with the, uh, in terms of even the rent inflation that Catherine might mention, it's probably not the same rate if in, in different location. And so what I'm trying to uh, hopefully uh, government um, can help us here while they're reviewing their housing policy, they need to look at different um, like scenario or how the impact of one policy to the rest of the uh, stakeholders of the rest of the people's like uh, any first home buyers for example incentives, is that going to uh, be impacted uh, investors, renters or other owner occupiers, for example. And uh, just like uh, the trends or the behavior of people like what Catherine mentioned about the inflation when it's, uh, or the interest is high, when they don't, can't spend uh, more, they're just uh, very conservative with spending. The same with housing. When the rent is too expensive, uh, people cannot buy. And uh, maybe our young younger generation or older people, they actually live with their families, become intergenerational sort of housing. So it's the behavior of uh, people actually also driven by all these complex issues. And I think, um, yeah, we need more research using uh, data, combining the uh, behavior and, and the uniqueness of the location rather than have a generic for uh, the whole uh, national uh, housing policy. Yeah, thanks, Connie. That's um, that's really helpful, and I'm sure is in interesting to people who are listening. Um, there's a question in the Q and A, and um, I'm going to just open this for anybody to to respond to. Uh, so the question is for um, uh, from uh, um, hang on, let me see. Maybe Catherine, are you answering this question at the moment? Yes. Thank you. It's the, <laughs> the would you like to respond to it? Uh, the rising inflation question yeah yep sure okay so just read, um, read the question and then respond yeah so the question is uh what is the cause of rising inflation is it due to demand pull or cost push um, and I would say we are seeing pressure coming from both directions. So obviously over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of input pressures. So things like your freight disruptions, floods, microchip shortages, you name it. Um, more recently, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but we have also seen strong demands for a range of products. So things like motor vehicles, um, furniture, really anything related to, to housing um, and, and obviously house construction as well, sort of demand being driven there. Um, so there, there is a bit of pressure coming from both sides of the equation. Okay, great. Would anybody else like to talk very briefly to that? Uh, just very briefly, in terms of housing price, I think uh, demand, of course, high, but the supply side is probably uh, driven the price high. There's not many housing in the market and people feel uh, fear of missing out. So they just that jack the price higher. Thank you. Mm. Okay. 
Well, it's obviously a, a, a complex um, area, and uh, you know, if there were simple solutions, then, they, then we'd already have them. Um, there's there's obviously a lot of different um, aspects of the the issue as well, and what um, I think this session has been able to do is to draw out some of those aspects and um, uh, provide some or shed some light onto those um, so that we can see what's going on. It's allowed us to sort of draw the cover off the, uh, the these issues that we read about and to be able to sort of peer under and see from the experts perspective from you, um, you know, what's going on in the economy. So I appreciate very much all of you being um, participating in this panel. Um, thank you for your insights and for your, your comments. Thank you very much to the participants here as well, um, to, the, to the audience. Um, and I also really want to thank the Centre for Data Science, in particular, Tim McCougar and um, Becky Cook for supporting and helping the, the, with this uh, webinar series. And also to our partners in this webinar series in Data Science in the News, that's the Queensland Academy of the Arts and Sciences. So on that, I'll say thank you to all the panelists again, and I say goodbye to all the audience. Bye.